Hi everyone, I'm Christoph from Snopa. This actually fits very nicely uh, onto the previous talk. So I'll be talking about evolving your analytics stack as your business grows. And I think they're a very nice example because they started with a batch pipeline. Now they have a really good, they got things running really smoothly with the batch pipeline. Now they have a compelling use case for real time. So they're looking to move into, into real time. And also at the very the end, the concluding talks, there were some there was a bit of mention about um, you want to get started with tracking the data as soon as possible. So you don't want to spend nine months, 12 months, 18 months getting things right one time, um, essentially just wasting time. It's time you could be collecting data, t um, data that will be very useful, useful afterwards. So you really want your analytics stack to be able to evolve as your business grows. So just get started and then grow your analytics stack with your business. That's what I'll, I'll, be, I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll keep it quite short because we have another talk and um, I think you all want to wanna hear from our, our users. So um, why, why do we need to evolve our analytics stack? Well, there's really two reasons. So first of all, your business is changing, your apps are changing, your platforms are changing, your company is changing, it, it's growing, whether it's a startup that grows to 50 people, 500 people, or even, even big existing companies, they might introduce new products, um, they might move into different businesses. Um, so your company is changing, but also your questions will change. If you're a good, smart analyst, if you're a data scientist, you won't be asking the same questions over and over again. You have a new question, you will find an answer. And based on the question you get, you, um, based on the answer you find, you will get five new questions. You will get to, you want to answer those. And it's a continuous process. So as you learn more, you will have new questions. And that means that you will need to often start tracking new data. You need to evolve your analytics stack. So um, we've really built Snowplow with, um, with the assumption that the analytics stack can evolve with your business. And it's actually quite different from many package solutions. If you use Adobe, if you use Google Analytics, it's, it's a much more fixed structure that, that allows you not as easily to, to evolve it as things change. So why, why is Snowplow a good fit when you want to e evolve the, the stack over time? Well, the, I want to highlight two particular examples. <laughs> so one is self-describing data. The other is data modeling. There's actually more bits, but I think those are the two ones I want to highlight today. And they for actually form quite nicely um, the two building blocks for an evolving data pipeline. Let me start with the self-describing data. Um, so initially when we started Snowplow um, almost exactly five years ago, um, um, we Snowplow began as, as a web first product back in the initial version one um, in early 2000, 2012. And we quickly realized that if we want to be a proper data pipeline, companies um, need to be able to track any event in their business. And companies are really quite different. So to highlight a couple of cases here, so Space Ape Games is a London-based games company. The events they're tracking are totally different from Picnic or from Gusto. Uh, a company that is in the, the online grocery grocery business. So a company like Space Ape Games, so they're really interested in, in understanding games, levels, castles. So those are the entities that are tracking. It's all about what's happening in the game. And note, this is actually very different from, from pages and the things you would have in a traditional web analytics solution. So players, games, level, castles. And the events they're tracking are building castles, forming alliances, um, declaring wars, making peace. So literally the events are nothing <laughs> like a page view event. It's literally custom to the games they're building. And it's totally different for, for Picnic. So they, um, the entities are tracking are products, customers, basket, delivery vehicles, um, items in the warehouse. There's all these kinds of things. And the events that are related to those entities are viewing a product, buying a product, a delivery that gets made, an item that is being moved around in the warehouse, um, a product that gets returned for some reason. So Again, a totally different set of events because they're in a totally different business from Space Ape, from a traditional e-commerce company, from a publisher. Every industry, every company will have a different set of events, will have a different set of, set of entities. So the way we, we tackled this, this, solution, this, this problem was by, by introducing those self-describing, um, by making the data self-describing. It's not the only way to use Snowplow. So Gausto is, is using it differently. So you guys are sending in unstructured data, has its benefits, comes with its trade-off. So 
this is the way we recommend, but it's definitely not the only only way to use the this data. So what, what does a self-describing event look like? So this is actually an example, a simplified example from one of our um, customers. It's um, it's UFC, it's the fighting championship in the in the US, um, Ultimate Fighting Championship. Um, so this is the example of a fighter entity. So this is a wrestler, um, has a name, has a nickname, it's a Facebook profile, ways, has some records. And actually they have in um, in reality like 30 plus um, 30 plus fields for the, the fighter entity. Um, so as you can see, there's like the description, we, we define what a what a fighter entity is. So we are UFC, it, the name of the schema is a fighter, and this is actually already version, uh, it's actually the second, well, the third iteration of this the schema. You already see that there's some evolving possible within those schemas. And then you just define like what are the properties. The JSON is a little bit simplified just because otherwise this wouldn't fit on the slide. Um, so if we want to send this in, this data, so we just send it in as a, as a self-describing event, uh, well, self-describing JSON. So we pass in the actual data fields. So we have first name, last name, the nickname, this guy is called DC, he weighs 205 pounds. Um, and the way we make it self-describing is, so if you wouldn't have the schema field, it would just be unstructured data. We just have a JSON we send in. Now, one way of doing it would, was it, um, you could pass in the whole schema with every single, with every single event, but that literally just doubles your your volume. So we, we just have a centralized repository, you host your schemas there, and you just essentially link to your schemas. You just provide the schema schema key. So you don't add a lot of weight to your data, but it's still a, a very structured way of, of sending in sending events. So that's just practically how we how we send in data. So what are what are some of the benefits? Well um, one thing that that so I, I consume a lot of the snowplow data and, and the validation piece is is really, really key for me. So if you schema your events, you always end up with a highly structured, high quality, quality data set. I think for me as, a, as an analyst who's, or data scientist who's consuming the data, um, that, is, that is just a big win. Someone actually needs to do the work at some point. So either you do it upfront, you schema the events, or someone who's gonna be consuming the data will need to do some ex additional cleaning, or will need to figure out what the actual schemas are. The schema will need to happen at some point so we just prefer to do it up front. Second benefit is actually we, we can load um, we can load the data very nicely in tidy tables in Redshift um, or soon any other any other data warehouse. Um, and there's also some big wins on on the real time real time side. Um, so those are some of the uh, quick wins of self describing self describing data. So that's self describing data. So the second thing I, I wanted to talk about was that the event data modeling piece. Um, so um, this is one, one definition we have uh, for event data modeling. But since the previous talk was about, um, was about cooking, I actually want to um, try an analogy here. Um, so if you think about it, so what Snowball delivers you is like the, the, <laughs> the box with your high quality organic ingredients. And what the data modeling is, is the recipe that is associated um, with it. So the data, the ingredients you get, the events, like I said, are high quality, um, but they're not the, not the end point. You actually need to do something with the data. And the, um, the events themselves, the, the ingredients, they themselves are actually, um, just by the nature of them, they're actually quite hard to consume. It's a big data volume, and a lot of the interesting stuff is actually sits between the events, it's a link between events. So if you do attribution, you want to connect transaction events or churn events or whatever you have uh, far down the funnel with those initial events. So where did the user initially come from? How did they progress to the <coughs> through the sign up sign up flow? So it's literally the meaning lies between those events, it's a chain of events. So that's something you would do in a data modeling is you're gonna start looking at what are the links between events. And the way you practically do it is you're gonna start aggregating, you're gonna start um, transforming the data. Um, so what does it mean in practice? So if you're looking at the event level data, first of all, it's immutable. Your event remains your event. If someone signed up in March 2015, 
that's still true five years from now. The user still signed up. It's just a fact. Um, well, maybe not in America these days. Um, but a fact is a fact. It's immutable. Your event log remains um, unchanged. The second thing is closely related. It's not opinionated. Uh, again, it's just a fact the user signed up. Um, but it's hard to consume. W the output of the, the data modeling process, on the other hand, is mutable. You will evolve your data modeling process over time. So you, m you might come up with a better segmentation algorithm. You might come up, you decide, well, maybe just traditional sessionization. It's not for us. I actually want to model around user intent or something different. So then you just update your data modeling and you, um, you change how you do things. And that is also what makes it, makes it opinionated. Then lastly, it's also easy to consume. Um, if the data is modeled in the right way, for example, for a funnel analysis, um, you can't just run a funnel analysis on, on the event level data. It's just not structured in the right way to easily visualize it in a BI tool, in Looker, in Metabase, in something else. So that's, um, that's data modeling. Um, so we, we usually, st the benefit with data modeling is that you can, we usually um, compute the data models over the whole event stream. There might be some performance reasons for doing it slightly differently. Um, but there's two key reasons why um, you want to always be able to look at historical events. So one is data that is arriving today might change your view of what happened in the past. Like if someone is signing up, um, something that actually looked like two separate users in the past, so someone using the website, someone using the iOS app, then suddenly if um, the user registers on the website and then two months later logs in on the iOS app, what initially looked like two different users, at the point when they log in, you suddenly realize, actually, these are not two separate users. This is the same user just using two different devices. You previously just didn't know because the user didn't tell you I'm actually the same user. But once they log in, once they register, you know these two different users should be merged together. That's an example of something, an event that arrives today that totally changes what you know about these two, two users in the past. And the second thing is because we can always recompute over the whole event stream, you can fundamentally totally change how, um, how you do the data modeling. If you make some dramatic changes, just spin up some additional clusters, recompute the whole thing, and you're fine. You have your new, more better, more evolved um, business logic that's running on top of the Snowplow data. So that's data modeling. So um, to combine this two, what does it mean in terms of evolving your data pipeline? Well, like I said, businesses change over time. And this also means that the events are going to change over time. And the second thing is you, how do you use how you use the data will change. So you constantly are using the data you're in, in building insight on top of the data. You're asking questions, getting new insights. New insights lead to more questions, and you have this visual vicious circle. So um, the way this this what this ends up in is you have two types of of ways to evolve the pipeline. You have things that are pushing and things that are pulling. So I'll explain both of them. So um, things that are pushing are um, if you add an additional data source. So let's say you initially didn't do email tracking. You add email tracking as a, a new data source. So you're going to add a new data source. You're going to create some new events. Um, you're going to update your data models. That is an extension that is your, you have some, some, um, um, some changes this way. Um, so the other example is the pull example, which is again what I highlighted before. I'm not sure what happened here. Um, this is like the circle you go through, like asking questions, getting insights, uh, making a, um, getting an answer, new insights, um, and so on. So what do you what do you do if you have a new question? Well, um, it's possible that your existing data model will be able to answer your question. So that's great. You don't need to do anything. You just get an answer to your question. But in many cases, you realize, actually, the way I currently do my data modeling doesn't let me answer this, this question. So then you need to think, actually, do I currently um, collect the underlying data? Um, if so, do I have an event that has the actual data that I need to answer this question? Well, then it's just a simple data model, update of the data model. I had a couple of dimensions or I start aggregating slightly differently or do something else in, in SQL and Spark, whatever you use for your data modeling. Um, and it's a relatively straightforward update. So you're already collecting the data, so you just update the data model, and suddenly you have an answer to your question. Um, 
And the nice thing is, because you have been collecting this data, you have the whole historical data set ready to go from, from day one. Um, so the last option is um, you have a question, you realize you can't answer, and you also realize you're, you're actually not tracking the data you need to track. So again, in the example, let's say you have a question about email and you don't track email opens. Well, obviously you need to start using the pixel tracker and start getting, getting the email, email data. So sometimes you need to actually update, update the data collection. So if you update the data collection, again, there's two ways of updating the data collection. Maybe there's a whole new event you need to add. So you're going to add an additional schema and you're going you're gonna to start tracking the new event. Or maybe you just need to extend an existing event. There's just this one field that we're missing. So because we have version schemas, you just update the schema version, you add the one field, and all the historic, all the events that are be still being sent in the old way, they will still be processed just fine. They will never pass, never fail validation. The whole versioning is, is built in. So it's fully backwards, backwards compatible. So those are the three steps. Um, so if you're faced with a question, maybe it's already answered by your existing data model. Maybe you're collecting the data, but you need to update how you model the data. And a third, maybe you need to update, update the tracking. But whatever situation you're in, you'll all be always be able to evolve your your stack to make a change and, and get your get your answers. Um, so that was my uh, quick quick talk. Any any questions? Yeah. So you were talking about um, building new models to answer new questions. So. Have you found in your experience that it's better to grab the models you have and build on top of them? You know, I've done one equation, let's do another one for the answer of that. Or is it better to almost para um, do it in parallel so that you almost recreate and duplicate that so you can answer the same questions you had before and the kind of new ones or mix of the two? I, I think it really depends on, 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 on the level of change you need to make. There's a lot of change that are simple additive changes. If you just need to add a dimension, that's, that's very straightforward. You don't need a parallel model. So there's a lot of these changes which are very straightforward. But sometimes there's, there's a whole class of questions which require a whole different way of modeling your data. So a good example is actually um, you guys are using Neo4j. That's a good example. A graph database will let you ask questions which you can't answer in a, just a traditional relational database. In, in just with a tabular structure. There's a whole different class of questions. And if you want to model your data for a graph database versus a traditional database like, like Redshift, you need to model your data totally, totally differently. So that's, I, that's the way I think about these things. So, but most of the time, it's just simple iterations of the existing data model. It's all additive changes in almost all, all cases. Here it is. Uh, uh, thank you very much for a very interest, interesting talk about the general philosophy about Snowflow, which is very interesting to have sometimes. Um, those were kind of the, 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 the good practices, the, the good things to keep in mind when you, when you set up an analytics pipeline and when you set up a data model, right? But sometimes it's also very instructive to know about how not to do it, right? <laughs> and, and I can see that in my daily life uh, all the time when I do an, uh, analysis or data, data science, I learn more from my mistakes than than from uh, my good practices. Okay. Do, you so want, do you want to share some bad practices? Uh, well, I, 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 I can share some bad practices. Um, so one, for example, is, um, or just, just more of as a, philosoph a philosophical thing, there is a huge benefit in structured data, yep. um, right? But there are now a few systems, I think mobile analytics is one of them, that also allow you to just fire in any event that you want and it will automatically create a schema for it it will create a table for it in the data warehouse. Why is that a very bad idea to do from a data modeling perspective? Mm. I think Alex might have a good answer to those questions. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult. So if you, if you don't have schema data, then I think, I think Christoph said it earlier, you're, you're essentially just pushing and, and delaying the, the problem of resolution. Um, and we, we saw this right back at the beginning of, of, of Snowplow when we'd been working um, with very unstructured data uh, in JSON stored in S3 and we were working with, um, with Hive and we were trying to figure out what was, what was in that data. And you just never, you never really know. And so the, the kind of the explicit design decision with Snowplow has, has been 
um, to, to schema your data up front. And, and what we're, what's kind of interesting is that a lot of the, the new data stores that are coming along, they're actually taking that assumption as well. So you know, there's a lot of buzz at the moment about Athena, um, AWS Athena, and, and that is, is very strict on, on structure. Um, and so, yeah, it, it seems to be the way that the industry is moving, but, but you're right, there's, there's always lots of, of, of tech out there that um, tries to do kind of schema detection. And, and we have tech that does that, so we have the Schema Guru project that um, you can give it a load of JSONs and it'll, it'll figure out what the, what the schema is. So I want, to, um, I want to add one thing, actually. So you can definitely get a long way with schema inference, but it's always, it's always the humans that are messing things up. So it's, it's just there's someone manually deciding what events need to be tracked. And just if you work in a big organization, there's going to be tens or hundreds of people that all interact with the analytics pipeline somehow. And you're just going to be sending in your data inconsistently unless you have an incredibly disciplined internal organization, which most companies, frankly, don't. So whenever we see companies use, for example, structured events, I've never seen a case where a company didn't create at some point a mess with a structured event um, just because there is no discipline on how on what we, we're not you're not enforcing anything so what you end up with is is just a lot of exceptions and case statements built in essentially your analyst will spend the additional time cleaning and practically just doing the schemaing again so you need to there has to be someone deciding what the structure is of the data at some point we just prefer to do it up front because then when you test the data you use something like snoop mini and within seconds, you can see whether your events fail or pass, uh, 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 yeah, fail or pass validation. Um, so you need to do the work once. And I prefer to know it when I do <laughs> when the app is in QA, not six months later when someone actually needs to use the data. Just to add very quickly on on that, um, it's very interesting to compare people who are running real time pipelines with those running in batch. In batch, there's a human being who's consuming the data in the data warehouse, and that gives you a chance to fix things after the fact. In real time, if it's a machine that's consuming that data, or potentially, you know, 20 different microservices, there isn't that opportunity. Um, so that's a big difference. Hello. Hey, yeah. Hi. So, yeah, these are all really good points I, I definitely agree with. Mm -hmm. And so then the question would be really, so what are the best practices to, you know, to handle all these schemas? Because in our case, let's say on the menu, only on the menu we have about, I think, 140 events that mm -hmm. I checked the, like, the last time. Yeah. So how do you then really, I mean, because there is like loads of different you know, software engineers working on you know, implementing these features. So what, what is the best practice then to, you know, to, to basically really handle all these J JSON schemas and, and to keep them up to date and all this stuff? Because yeah. that's what we struggle with, I think, at the moment. And that would be, yeah, we need to come up with something that would really help us to easily, you know, keep all these schemas, and then we have to have like structured events. Yeah, and that's why we don't have them at the moment, I think. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of there's a couple of things here. So, one is just the process of creating and managing schemas. So I think there's a lot we can do at Snowplan to build better tooling. So that's actually something we're actively working on. So, people that use scheming, I hope you guys are all using Igloo CTL. So that al already automates quite a bit of the process. And we're spending a lot of time this year, again, to try to automate the process as much as possible. And we're thinking of even going further to make the whole management of, of your schemas um, easier. So that's, that's one thing we're doing, is just the creation and management piece of, of your schemas. I think the second thing is there's a trade-off between um, creating, you have like 140 different events or so. You probably don't want 140 different, different schemas. Just in Redshift, that will create 140 different tables which you all need to join together. So that is that is not a good good trade-off. So what I always try to do is um, is find a balance. Like there might be a single schema that um, is sits somewhere in the middle. So the schema is used to track multiple events, but it's already it is enforcing what the possible values are. So then you just have a single schema that serves mul serves as a single schema for multiple events, but you still enforce what the possible values are. And especially if you use the entities, the context very heavily, that's also a good way of consolidating and reducing the number of schemas, schemas you have. So there's, I don't have a good answer. Maybe someone else has some input there. I think it's a bit of a trade-off you want to you want to strike there. So there's probably, if you have the, those a couple of those multi-purpose event schemas, I think um, there's some benefit in that. 
just for a split second, if you dip to like the more like the commercial solution, that's probably something that they tackled really early on, where they've got these massive screens to represent just about everything you can think about, with some kind of like reservations for future things that might come along. Um, and you might say, look, man, it's, it's, it's a massive thing when you have like you know, a thousand reserved variables or whatever. But at least you know, at least you've got a little bit of arm's length to, to grow as, as, as time goes along. Um, I agree, totally agree. I mean, having multiple schemas per event just leaves you with a bit of a headache downstream. Um, so you might, you might want to think about having a catch-all that you do up front. Uh, Alex, yeah. Let me give the microphone. Just to, to kind of add to Christoph's first point, so one of the things that we're sort of observing a lot, especially amongst um, users who are using Snowplow as a, as a unified log, is that actually a lot of their entities are coming from very strongly typed like origins. So if you've got like a lot of um, APIs or uh, like a, a web a web app or whatever, and you've got entities inside that, so you've got you know Java objects or you've got like Ruby classes or, or whatever it is, then actually those entities are starting as very structured things. So one of the one of the kind of things we want to do at Snowplow is make it a lot easier for a developer to go from those those definitions in their code that they're very comfortable with to actually just feeding that into the schema registry. Because otherwise it's just quite a lot of work to sort of almost you're almost recreating the entities and they've actually been defined already. Um, and that's one of the nice things about, you know, kind of one of the points of sort of schemering everything is this stuff has started schemered anyway. It started as well-defined objects in your .NET code or your Java code or your Ruby code or whatever. Any other questions? Perfect. Um, so I just I just wanted to go back to your you showed and models and model data yeah. and and uh, I think user sessions funnels and and all that. Um, and I assume that's part of the processing, so that's like the key in ETL, right? It's, pr it's a processing layer on top of the unmodeled data that's running. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, the challenge I've often found is that um, you want to you give analysts, so everyone who accesses the data, visibility as to what the model actually is, and also mm -hmm. help them if they wanted to try something different, like they wanted to have a different funnel, they wanted maybe to, to define users differently. Like someone might be saying, oh well, I don't want to look at sessions as, you know, 30 minutes, so I want to look at daily sessions, I want to look at monthly sessions, something like that. And give if you give analysts the chance to change that, actually give a lot of power to mm -hmm. the end users. And in an ETL process, it's very hard because it's all you know sitting in a system somewhere that's running on a batch, and to get it changing, it, it takes a lot of effort. Yep. And so there's, there's a, there are tools out there like Looker, which they give you this modeling layer, that they call it LookerML for them, that analysts can actually yeah. change that themselves. So I'm wondering, how do you guys expose this modeling, and is it accessible like programmatically, or can analysts actually change it, and how easily, and what are the thoughts around that as well? Yeah, we don't, so I would say that about half of Snowplow users actually use Looker. It's by far the most popular tool to use on top of Snowplow data, so a lot of the data modeling actually happens happens in Looker. I think LookML is, is great for your for your data modeling, especially because it, it does good job at, at making it accessible for, for everyone. LookML, the barrier to update to LookML is much lower. Plus, if you go into the Explorer and Looker, it's, it's a great way of interacting with the data without writing a single line of SQL. So I think that's just a totally, totally fine solution. The, it's more challenging if you, and especially the if you have larger data volume. So if you hit like billions of events, and suddenly if you want to have all this run in a performant way, then um, you you're going to need to make trade-offs, which make it harder for people to make changes on the fly to the data model. So make, start exploring the data just because the volumes, even in, in something like Redshift, have just become very, very big. And if you want to write these things in a performant way, they also become slightly less readable. I think there's a bit of a trade-off in, in SQL there. Um, I think, yeah, I don't think, I don't have a good answer there. It's something we, we, um, we see people struggling with, with too. I think it's very hard to, f to if especially if you have built up a lot of, a lot of SQL queries or something, whatever you use for your data modeling, to that that take the events and, and model them somehow to to really understand what the underlying business logic is. Um, it's really it's it's obfuscated within within all the all the SQL. 
which makes it very hard to, to start changing definitions and, and start experimenting with the data. Um, so yeah, I don't have, a, don't have a good answer there. If you have any ideas, let me know. Just a quick um, separate question while I hold the mic. <laughs> yeah, feel free. Um, so the, the, the JSON model you described, I suppose, is, is for web, or do you also have seen people using it for native mobile apps? Or, then, or do you, do yeah, you think that's Yeah, we have people, um, yeah, we have people tracking from Internet of Things. There's literally from cameras, from warehouses, from delivery trucks. We there's data coming from all over the place. Okay. And mobile apps too. <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, thank you, Christoph. We're gonna take a ten ten minute break uh, for some more drinks and coffee stuff.